Uh, welcome everybody to our uh, online discussion uh, today on uh, state control of the internet and fake news in the age of COVID-19 and especially in Africa. We have an, uh, uh, an eminent uh, uh, panel ready to discuss uh, the issues related to fake news uh, and COVID-19 and internet control uh, on, this, uh, on this huge, uh, huge continent. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to welcome them in, uh, in a moment. Let me uh, welcome uh, Agnieszka Walorska, who is a, a German technology innovation expert. Uh, Flavia Kalula Nabagabe, who is uh, the uh, team leader of the women's movement, of the people power movement uh, in Uganda. Uh, Anne Katrin Riedel, who is a German digital activist. Refilowe Nitzeke, who is a member of the provincial parliament in uh, South Africa. And we are uh, also hoping to have uh, William Tucker, a politician from Sierra Leone. And uh, perhaps we will also be joined by Clement Stambouli, who is a politician from Malawi. I would, uh, without uh, any further ado, uh, move on uh, to give the floor to uh, Agnieszka uh, for some introductory uh, uh, remarks uh, on the issue of uh, internet control uh, and fake news. Please go ahead, Agnieszka. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I, I'm the first, yes. <laughs> um, so I just, um, the, the study I published for the uh, Norman Foundation about deep fake was just uh, publicized. So um, that's basically my connection to this topic. So uh, I'm not particularly an Africa expert, but um, what my expertise is in is especially how uh, artificial intelligence can be um, used to uh, support misinformation, like for example, for, uh, for deep fakes. Um, obviously, the study was uh, published before the coronavirus, so uh, it, or it was written before the coronavirus. It was um, published uh, just lately, um, so these aspects are not there yet. But since then, we actually had quite an interesting uh, development, uh, because obviously, in the times of insecurity uh, and um, yeah some difficulties with access to reliable information. Um, the opportunities for spreading misinformation uh, are uh, definitely almost uh, unlimited. Uh, so it's maybe not particularly relevant from the, for the, from the perspective of the uh, deep fake. Um, although we actually, due to all these Zoom conferences that we are having right now, like we now, there is actually quite a new trend in the deep, deep fake technology. So, um, you don't, you are not only able to have like a Zoom background like I'm having right now, but actually right now you can impersonate um, almost every person you, you wish. So I could actually speak here as Barack Obama, for example, um, with just few technical tricks, which I will not demonstrate right now. <laughs> um, so obviously with all this video conferencing, we have all additional opportunities for, for misinformation and um, Obviously, like some of you saw the uh, dolphins uh, in Venice, uh, which is maybe not a deep fake, but definitely um, a use of um, image editing for spreading misinformation. Um, but we also have some interesting positive developments, I think. So uh, when you look at Facebook and, and Twitter and also YouTube, they were very cautious um, about um, limiting the spread of misinformation, especially when it comes to politicians. Um, so basically they said uh, that's free speech and if the politicians are lying in their ads or spreading misinformation, it's kind of not our problem. Uh, but with, um, for, like, for example, Jair Bolsonaro spreading um, uh, false news about the coronavirus and we saw that we had similar issues from different African leaders as well. Uh, Facebook actually changed um, some of their policies and they are right now also fact-checking um, some of the uh, communication by political leaders. So that's maybe the, the introduction from my point of view. Thank you very much. That's a, a 
I think, an excellent uh, way to enter into uh, in, in, into this discussion. Indeed, uh, I, I almost wish that you would show us yourself as Barack Obama. <laughs> I've never actually seen this in reality, um, but may, may, maybe next time uh, or, or maybe not later. Easy. So you, you really have to have a powerful computer, so you cannot just, uh, so it, it's, it's not that easy. And given that the internet connection is not always very stable, it, it might cause some troubles, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we do that next time. Uh, Next, I should like to go to, uh, to Flavia in, uh, in, in Uganda. Uh, of course, in Uganda, you face uh, s s several problems uh, with, with the government uh, as a people power movement. Uh, of course, the movement of, of Bobby Wine uh, and, and many others. Uh, and it will be interesting to hear uh, how the uh, internet also plays a part in that. Uh, Flavia, you, you have the screen. Thank you very much, Juth. Um, hello, everyone. I want to inform, I, I'm glad that you are here today, this afternoon. I hope that you're all fine in your various countries. It's absurd that the whole world is kind of on a lockdown right now. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, we are just praying and at the mercy of God that at some point we are able to get, that at some point we are able to get um, uh, a, a solution to this pandemic that uh, that is uh, clearly destabilizing the entire world. My name is Flavia Kalule Nawagawe, and I come from Uganda, which is in East Africa, in the African uh, in Africa. I am the team leader of the Women Wing of the People Power Movement Uganda. I will briefly tell you about the People Power Movement. The People Power Movement in Uganda is uh, a non-violent uh, social and political. Uh, movement that is um, that is that whose main aim is uh, geared towards rem the removal of the dictatorship. We have had one president for 35 years now since 1985, and with time we have seen him gradually deteriorating from um, following the rule of law, um, following human rights, to abusing them and being more dictatorial each and every time. So it is led by our principal called Honorable Robert Chagulani who is also commonly known as Bobby Wine, and uh, it is largely comprised of young people because as we speak right now, uh, the biggest population of Uganda comprises of people aged between, um, between 15 years and 35 years. So, and most of these are agitated about what is happening and they would want to see a change in leadership because they were born in one leadership and they still have that. Uh, so I, I, I am the team leader of the Women Wing of that. It is not a political party; it is just a political movement. And so we are, work, and we are, we are changing the politics of the country. But also, we are trying to see that we liberate ourselves from uh, dictatorship. Now, Jules, thank you so much for this topic about state control of the internet and fake news in the time of COVID. 19. I know it is very difficult right now for all of us in our various countries, but it is also worse when it comes to a country that was already governed by dictatorship and then we have this and so you have to really control the internet. Now in Uganda, we have really tried, the government, I have to give credit to the government, they have tried to, uh, to control uh, the, the spread of COVID-19 because uh, they, we are using more preventive measures because I know that because of our ailing health system, if this, uh, if co if COVID-19 was to break out in large numbers, most of our people would end up dying, especially the women who would mostly get affected. Now, uh, of course, before the pandemic hit Uganda, we were using the internet, most of us, and some were using the media, the mainstream media, including radios and including um, TV stations to get the news about the COVID-19. Unfortunately, before it hit Uganda, most people, especially most young people, these days get uh, news very fast from the social, the various social media platforms, including Facebook, including uh, WhatsApp, including Twitter, including you know um, all the other social media pages. And so most people, the fake news was spreading very rapidly. <laughs> I must say that at some point people were extremely worried and uh, were sent into a panic mode because it was an overload of information of fake news, which was coming in. For example, they would tell us uh, if you touch, before we actually got the proper, you know, the proper information of don't 
social distancing, don't touch people, cough when you're closing your mouth, it's the things like that. People were scared, they were being told that if you use something that someone has used of COVID, you're going to get it. If you eat food that the other person has eaten on, you're going to get COVID. If you, if you dress up in the same clothes that the other person has worn, you're going to get COVID. So people were in, uh, in a panic mode because they didn't know what to believe and what not to believe. We got a number of people, currently we, we are faced with a challenge that um, most of the people who are, who are being discharged from the hospitals, those that had been um, those that had been diagnosed with COVID-19, but are now pos but are now negative and are being discharged, already they are facing a stigmatization problem back in their homes when they go back. It is very difficult for them to reintegrate into society because of the fake news that we used to get. They believe even just by touching that person, you're you're going to get COVID. They believe that because mo very few people know that if you have got the virus and you're cured of it. It is, uh, more, it is more likely known for you known to infect other people, but people still have the fear. So you find in homes, people are isolated, even in that community. You find that their beds are isolated. No one wants to go next to them if it's a mother who is breastfeeding. No one wants to touch the baby and the mother. So this is all a result of the internet and the fake news that we have got. But I think for me, at the start when we had the fake news coming in, overflowing at a very rapid, uh, you know, because everyone could just put up and people were really worried. There was something that uh, on a number of platforms that I shared that started coming in to give people hope. For example, people with the right information started sharing it in time. And for me, I think that was where the challenge was, that uh, the government left people to circulate fake news for a very long time before giving us the proper information that we required. And then people started, uh, the ones who knew started giving us the proper information and it kind of calmed down people. Also people started spreading information of hope because before everything was, if you do this, if you do this, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going. So people were worried about everything. But then the people started sending out positive messages like, if you stay at your home, you will protect the life of someone and so you will reduce. So the message then started coming in in a more hopeful manner, which made people uh, have hope and also lose their fear of the epidemic. But also I think if we want to control fake news, we, can, we need to eliminate the gaps in information like the ones that were there. For example, if it were the government, they need to use all the spaces that are occupied by citizens. For example, our young people on social media go to social media, put there the proper information so that they are not looking for it. From elsewhere, I know that a number of young people fear going into the Ministry of Health pages or government official pages. So if they don't, if they fear going there, or if they don't even know how to navigate around those official documents, the big documents that usually come from the government, then can we simplify the information from for them? So that it is in their local languages, which they understand very well. It is on their local media. It is on in their. It is in their spaces. Use drawings that are enticing for them to understand and things like that. So I think that's it for now. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Jules, and uh, I look forward to an incredible discussion with the rest of my comrades. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Flavia. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's always fascinating to see the hurdles that you have to take in, uh, in, in Uganda. Uh, the government is trying to be very clever in, the, in the putting you down, but they, they don't really seem to be succeeding, uh, which is I think, extremely encouraging uh, to see. Uh, let's move straight to, to Refilue in, uh, in, in South Africa. Uh, abroad, the, the government, and especially President Ramaphosa, got quite a positive press. Uh, for taking early measures uh, and also for his, his approach that we saw in the media. I know that on the ground it isn't all, all quite uh, uh, as easy as it is, uh, as it is seen abroad. Uh, so how do you see this and particularly in, uh, in regard to, uh, to, the, uh, to the internet? Refiloe. Thank you so much, Jules. Good afternoon, all panelists. Good afternoon here in South Africa and all the viewers from wherever you are in the globe. Um, I think I, just a quick overview. So I'm Rufilo Nseke, I'm a provincial member of parliament, but I also ser serve as the national spokesperson of the official opposition party in South Africa. And I think for us, fake news um, 
the government, when we went into lockdown, literally went used the Disaster Management Act, and with it came a regulation that basically said anybody who published it, anything, a statement through any media, whether social or otherwise, then they've actually violated the media and you can actually get arrested for spreading fake news, which I think is a good call because when you have a pandemic, you actually want to make sure that the right information is going out there. However, as an opposition party, obviously our stance around the lockdown is slightly different from what government has been proposing. Yes, we welcome the fact that we went into a lockdown, but the methodology around the lockdown for us was more to say, while you do go into lockdown, there's got to be a means to also make sure that you save lives, but, you, but you also make sure that you also save livelihoods. You can't just do a blanket lockdown that doesn't consider the fact that before we even went into lockdown, we were already downgraded. So South Africa was also already sitting in a recession. And how would we then come out of this recession if we're already on lockdown and are not allowing any form of economy to happen? So for us, I think the fake news is being dealt with. But what is interesting about media is that South Africa as an opposition party, we don't actually get a lot of traction in the main media stream. But what has come, sometimes within a tragedy, one finds that you find opportunities. And some of the opportunities that we've now found is we started something called Corona Cast, which sits on a similar platform as this one, where we now started on Tuesdays and Friday. In fact, right now as we're speaking, the leader of the DA is on a, the Corona Cast talking to different aspects in terms of how we see the lockdown progressing for South Africa and the loss to the economy. So we then can see that social media has become a mess, an opportunity for us to actually get our message across as the opposition party, fighting for the economy, for a softer lockdown, and to also say we want to see information around how government came up with that informed them moving from stage four to five and now moving keeping us in lockdown stage four, which, is, which still feels like quite a strong lockdown. And yet you can see there's basically a revolt in the, in the country in the sense that people want to go back to work because livelihoods are not actually being looked at. The other challenge that we face, the measures that the government are putting in place are actually anti, or let me call them pretty much racist because you find they say that businesses, there's a means of, helping them during this difficult time. Yet at the same time, they put their BEE requirements into that, which is Black Economic Empowerment. So they only say, if a business is 51% Black owned, they'll be helped. But the sad part is, even a business that is white owned might employ 40, 50 Black people. So you're actually still punishing the very people that you need to be saving. So for us, fake news is not affecting South Africa in the mainstream of us in order to perform our job up our work as an opposition. It's more just holding government to account. And the interesting thing, I think, I'm not sure how to say your name, is it Agnesia? When you spoke about people being able to use pseudo, um, pseudo persona in, in Zoom meetings, in parliament, we pushed for virtual parliamentary meetings so that we can oversight what the government is doing. We sort of got it right now. They've sort of started some of the meetings happening. Last week, sometimes there was an interesting situation where the speaker, as, he was, as she was speaking, there was porn that was bombarded into, into the Zoom meeting and they ended up having to stop the meeting and relook the securities around social media and the virtual meetings. So those are some of the dynamics that come into play because people say, now we're able to infiltrate spaces that they were not able to do before. So those are some of the things we're dealing in with. But that's where we are in South Africa at the moment. And we continue to fight to say, I think there's a, what we call a smart lockdown as the DA, which pushes for the saving of lives, proper testing, tracing, and also screening of people so that you can get proper stats to inform how you implement different stages of a lockdown. And that's what we are trying to push for as an opposition party in South Africa and say, we do need to get economically active. We don't want to come out of lockdown and we don't have a country left because the economy is drained. So many people have now gone on welfare. In fact, the prediction is that South Africa will potentially lose 7 million jobs when we come out of this lockdown. 
And that's kind of to give it an overview of where South Africa is at. Thank you, Jules. Thank you so much for that, uh, Philoe. It's, uh, uh, it's a tough situation in, uh, in, in South Africa. Uh, I'm in the same lockdown that you're in, uh, and it's, uh, it's absolutely not, uh, not easy for us, but I imagine it's even harder for people in townships uh, where there is uh, a great poverty uh, and people really need to, need, need to work to pay for their food, but uh, at the same time, of course, they want to stay uh, free from COVID-19. It's, it's an extremely, extremely difficult uh, situation. Uh, I, I want to move to Anne Katrin in, uh, in, in Germany, um, uh, an activist in this, uh, in, in this field, but also someone who has uh, occupied herself with, with Africa uh, in, in the past. Uh, what are your views, uh, Anne Katrin? And yeah, hi from Berlin, and thank you for the invitation, Jules. Um, yes, I'm the chairwoman of Load, an association for liberal internet policy, and we're dealing currently with a um, Corona tracing app, which will be implemented also here in Germany. And um, of course, I'm also dealing a lot with uh, disinformation. And uh, like Agnieszka, I wrote a paper um, on this topic for the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Mine is not yet published, and it's about disinformation on Messenger. Uh, services such as WhatsApp. And um, regarding the situation here in Germany, we faced um, some disinformation in the beginning of the corona um, pandemic here. And I think which is very important is that we not only have this worldwide pandemic, we also have, like the World Health Organization said, this worldwide infodemic. So we have these problems all over the world. And uh, I think the biggest problem here in Germany is not disinformation itself, but conspiracy, conspiracy theories, uh, which will fit a bit uh, into each other, I think. So it's, I think it's hard to separate both of it. And um, what I see what's um, a big problem here in Germany, which I tried also to line out in my paper, is that the government um, and also the press don't, doesn't have a focus on, um, on messenger services. So we saw in the beginning of the pandemic here in March that there were some um, disinformation sent through WhatsApp um, as a voice message and uh, which um, we're talking about like there will be a, a huge lockdown in Germany and the Ministry of Health is not informing us and about um, there was a, a rumor about uh, ibuprofen, this um, painkiller. And so we started a little bit here in Germany to need to recognize that um, Telegram where right now are a lot of conspiracy conspiracy theories are spread it are a huge problem and that we are talking too much uh, about Facebook and Twitter and YouTube which are still a huge problem but we have all this dark social on the messengers and we try we need to find out how to reach these people and um, so I think another problem is and that's what I also try to line out in my paper is that we when we talk about fake news we always talk about news like text but we have a big problem not only with um with with manipulated videos like um Agnieszka said but also with pictures memes humorous um stuff which will be sent very easily through uh through whatsapp for example and which people touch this um, emotionally. So they spread it in a very easy way and it's very hard to debunk um, this emotional content or pictures itself. So it's easy to have a fact checking on articles which are manipulated or totally invented, but it's very hard to make fact checking on this uh, emotional stuff. So I think we are here in Germany at the very, very beginning um, regarding disinformation and debunking all of this. And I think we're watching on this too narrow because we think like if we give the people the facts, they will stop believing it, but this is not gonna happen. Um, so there's a, it's a very um, broad, there are very broad reasons why people start believing in disinformation or conspiracy theories. So it's a lot about uh, trust in media, trust in the government and all of this stuff. And uh, we have the same situation as Flavia lined out in Uganda, um, ministries or the government lacks in communicating on the social media 
channels on which the people are. So they have their um, Facebook and Twitter accounts, okay, but they realized, and I'm happy they developed it very fast, that they need to be also on messengers where the people are. So the Ministry of Health, they started a Telegram channel where they will send um, some information. So um, we here in Germany, I think, really find, are finding out um, that disinformation is a very big problem and especially a problem in our country. It's not only a threat from um, third countries like Russia or China or other countries and that we have to do something against it. But as I said, we are in the very beginning. And um, another problem with all of these um, conspiracy theories is that uh, we, will, we see a, a huge movement of right-wing people, of people um, who are against vaccination and uh, all of this stuff. And they are right now joining together. And uh, I think there will be um, a very, very huge problem we are facing because there are people from the left, from the right, and all of them criticizing our government because we are having a very luxury problem here. Germany is doing very, very well here in Germany uh, um, with the corona pandemic. And we can be so lucky regarding this. But a lot of people right now think that um, we did too much and that too many of our civil liberties got um, shrinked and that the government wants to do something bad um, to us. And so this is a very, um, yeah, good uh, environment for all this conspiracy theories. And uh, that's, yeah, the situation here in Germany. Thank you very much for that, uh, anne Catherine. Uh, yeah, conspiracy, uh, uh, Conspiracy uh, theories um, are, uh, are, are a big thing, and I think we see them coming up uh, in Africa as well. Let me move uh, next to, uh, uh, to William, uh, William Tucker, who is in, uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, a seasoned African politician, the former vice president of the Af Africa Liberal Network. Uh, William, how do you see uh, the, the things from, uh, from a West African uh, perspective? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. No. No. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay fantastic. Um, William again, the former vice president of the ALN West Africa. And uh, I've listened to my colleagues and um, it seems as if it's cut across the whole of the region and even globally. And what I have come to realize is, and I want to simplify this. Now, the fight against the COVID-19 is a difficult fight for the various government and stakeholders. Because what has happened is this, the opposition parties have taken the opportunity to see how they can project themselves as against the ruling government. And this cuts across in, if you go to Nigeria, it happens, you go to Ghana, you go to Sierra Leone here, it's the same. And so that is the emanation of the fake news. And that is coming exactly from the opposition um, uh, the parties. Why? That's the only way they think they can download and they can be able to destabilize the ruling government so that they can take off power the, the next election. So the government is caught in between. How do you handle COVID? How do you handle fake news? You cannot... Are you getting me? Okay, so, so how do you handle fake news? They are caught in between now, so how to fight the COVID and how to fight the fake news. Fake news in Africa is not coming with most times they are coming from outside of the region, of the continent. You have people who are in the diaspora, they do recordings, they send it to the people because people believe in them. And because of lack of information provided by the government, the various government, the people here rely on those information coming from their brothers and sisters from diaspora to poison the minds of the society. Now that is why, that explains the reason why it took time for people to believe that in fact we have COVID in Africa. 
It took time for people to believe that the weather has nothing to do with the corona. It took time for people to believe that the heat has nothing to do with corona. And this was propagated by who? By those who are against the current system. It's gone across in every aspect of Africa. I've followed them, Nick. And it, it, it is so difficult for the government now. You want the government to fight fake news. You want the government to fight fake, fake news. You want them to fight uh, corona. How do they fight the, the fake news? If, you, if they be very much stringent in their doctrine, the, the civil rights organizations will come up, the human rights will come up and say, oh, the free, there has to be freedom of speech, freedom of justice, freedom of movement and everything. So now it becomes very difficult for them. Here, they, we have very terrible people who will send in information and people here rely on those information. And it is not in the interest of the country, it is not in the interest of the people, but then they will listen and sometimes they even act on. And at the, at the end of the day, the people suffer, the government suffer. I remember one time uh, last month that the information came in from Europe, from Sierra Leone abroad. They said, oh, there are Chinese people who are going to be giving, them, giving people injection down up the provinces. And you can't believe that people had to go to schools collect their children and they are in the event of that now they had to, some lives had to go. These are the troubles about fake news. But how do you curb that? It's a problem of the government. The government is finding it difficult. There are regulations to it, but then if you put if you slam the regulations, it is like you are gagging the press. If you slam the regulations it's like you are you are, don't want to entertain um, uh, news coming in, you want to entertain the, the public, you want to entertain opposition views. So it's a bit a uh, very dire situation for them. So it's our opposition, but we do our own thing constructively so that for the good of the continent and our country in particular. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, uh, William. Um, let's see, uh, we have, uh, I think, been joined by uh, Clement Stambouli from Malawi, uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, being able to, uh, uh, to, to join us. Um, I don't know if you've, uh, you've heard any of the previous uh, interventions, but it would be good to have uh, your perspective uh, from Malawi uh, on the, the fake news and uh, uh, okay. the control of the internet issue uh, by, uh, by the government. Clement, please. I've just uh, managed to join you. It's been a battle because of our problems with uh, the internet. However, yes, indeed, we are having a big problem here where it regards fake news. Maybe the problem is greater than uh, most of you, our colleagues here, because we have reached a stage whereby the government is putting announcements on the radio about fake news, especially concerning COVID-19. There is a lot of fake news on uh, the internet, it be Facebook, it be WhatsApp, which is very disturbing. In some instances, uh, people are claiming that uh, there is no COVID-19 in Malawi. The government is just coming up with all these stories in order to have some intervention. And yet we have court cases. In some cases, when uh, people are found with uh, the challenge, others are coming in with uh, fake news as if they interviewed the people, which is also infringing on uh, their privacy. Because a health issue is a personal issue and uh, it is not good for people to be coming up with fake news concerning other people's health situation. And uh, my fear is that uh, as these things are coming up, the, we might end up having a problem, especially where it regards restrictions from the government. Because when fake news reaches a certain proportion, it might also infringe on our freedom of uh, the press, freedom of expression, and uh, other such things. Because in the end, they are even issuing um, requests from people 
to be reporting those who are sending the news that is deemed as not being correct. And uh, that is also a bit dangerous because at the end of the day, we people being arrested and having people having problems because of the famous. Uh, sorry that I have not heard the intervention of, of uh, the other people who, who had uh, come in area. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you for that, Clement. Um, I, uh, we, we have uh, been quite, uh, we've been using our speaking time quite liberally. Uh, what do you expect in a group of liberals? Uh, I don't think that's a, that's that's a problem, um, but but we are slowly approaching uh, the, the the end of of the discussion. So I think we will limit ourselves to two discussion rounds, uh, and uh, I, I would like to go to a. a Final round, which gives you the opportunity to respond to other things that you have heard, and maybe to expand a little bit more on uh, on what you've just said uh, yourself, uh, Agnieszka. Uh, I'm, I'm still intrigued by when we will see deep fake arrive in Africa. We haven't seen it yet, uh, but that's maybe because technologically we're not uh, uh, quite far ahead uh, at, at the moment. Uh, who knows, uh, Agnieszka? Uh, we didn't see maybe many of the deepfakes in Africa, but actually one of the prominent uh, deepfake uh, cases is from Gabon, uh, which actually was not a deepfake, but uh, just that the people anticipated that it might be a deepfake, it causes, caused actually a political crisis. Um, so you probably heard that the, uh, that the president of Gabon, he was uh, severely sick, he, he had a stroke, and he hasn't been seen in um, public for a while and after he actually uh, came to to address uh, people at um, uh, I think for the for the new years um, there was were wide speculations that this is just a deep fake that in reality he's dead and it's uh, just like a made-up video so uh, I think that's the interesting problem with the deep fakes that you don't even have to make deep fakes to make people think uh, that that it might be it and just just the knowledge that they exist can actually uh, cause this kind of uh, this kind of issues. And if I have like one more minute, <laughs> um, like a part of the deepfakes, what I'm observing. So I I have like two home countries, and the other one is Poland, where where I was raised. And uh, um, this country is actually really uh, severely hit by by disinformation, especially from from the government perspective. So um, there were um, very, very little information about how many co uh, COVID cases they were. They really used the situation to spread um, insecurity, to, um, to, to actually introduce some of uh, yeah, autocratic uh, measures. And uh, we actually were supposed to have elections uh, last, uh, last Sunday there even though no one is really uh, actually allowed to leave home. So they wanted to change the election system just shortly before the election so we can all vote uh, by, a, um, by a post. And, um, and they just, uh, just canceled it like three days before the elections. So we have uh, very close to, to Germany, which is actually doing, doing so fine when it comes to, to this information. Uh, we have countries like Poland er, and, and Hungary, which, uh, which are dealing with a totally different problems uh, and, and the misinformation and disinformation uh, actually not from the bottom up, uh, but, uh, but uh, from the up to the bottom, so from, from the government itself. Thank you very much. Yes, the, the, the Polish situation is, a, is also a, fa a fascinating one. Uh, 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 at the moment, uh, uh, one, one of the countries where uh, uh, we're facing some some, some big problems, yeah, um, COVID nineteen also seems to be playing a part in that. Uh, yeah. So thank you for for raising that. Uh, Rafilwe, you would like to come in uh, now. I think um, there's an interesting dynamic, and I think my counterparts from the rest of the African continent will probably attest to something similar. Generally, within Africa, you find that this traditional medicines. And with Madagascar, having said that they found a cure for corona, which obviously has not been tested, I think we are, what I'm, I omitted to 
let everybody know about is that on particularly on WhatsApp and I, there's a, a prominent leader in South Africa called Zolenzi Mavabi who claims that he used the same traditional herb to, co to overcome COVID. He was tested a few weeks ago and he, was, he even posted it on Twitter to say that he's now overcome Corona via this particular herb. So that's one of the big things that is actually being spread around because the challenge is we don't know if he, he actually got cured or whether it was actually through this herb because it hasn't been scientifically tested. And I'm not discouraging it, I'm not discounting it because we don't know whether it could be a cure for Corona. But that's one of the biggest things that is now being disseminated as information through various social media platforms around South Africa. The other thing is, I think initially when Corona came in, into South Africa. It was somebody who traveled overseas and came to South Africa. And if you look at South Africa's own apartheid legacy, people, particularly in townships where it's predominantly black people were saying, I'll never get Corona. This illness is for white people who travel overseas on aeroplanes. So talking about livelihoods versus um, lives, people are saying, you keep us in our houses, we're gonna die of poverty and starvation and outside we'll catch Corona. And now what we are actually as the DA trying to hold um, government to account on the basis of this to say, how many lives will actually be lost from starvation and poverty versus how many lives could potentially be lost from Corona itself, which is a difficult space to be. So you actually have to weigh those. And obviously the conversation, it's not necessarily fake news, but it's conversations that people, ordinary citizens themselves are starting to say, it's quite frankly, would rather brave Corona, but we've got families to look after and we want to go out there and brave this Corona. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Rafilue. That was, uh, uh, yeah, the discussion about the herbal medicines is, is an interesting one. And I, I understand that the product from Madagascar is being exported across Africa at the moment. Uh, so let's, let's see. Uh, Flavia, would you like to uh, come in for your uh, for your final minute? Thank you very much, Jules. Uh, it's interesting what Ra Refiole just said about the Madagascar issue because it caused a lot of um, <laughs> it mixed feelings here in Uganda when it was discovered that Madagascar had got a cure. And to make matters worse, there was news that um, uh, Trump was asking for that cure. <laughs> in the US so he could use it as well. But also that got me thinking about the time when uh, Uganda, here in Uganda, our Speaker of Parliament, uh, the Right Honorable uh, Kadaga, mentioned that the, he, she had got a doctor who was coming up with a cure for, for COVID. And the whole country was, you know, shocked because they kept wondering, okay, if everyone is suffering from COVID and for you, you say you have a, a a doctor, he, she, she, she showed us a white guy who was working alongside some Busoga people, people from the Eastern region in Uganda, who were saying that they have the cure for COVID and the government was asking for more and more money from different um, entities to give them money to fight COVID. And here she was with the cure and kept wondering whether this coming from a speaker of parliament was even right. And afterwards she came out and said, oh, by the way, that was wrong. The information that the media put out there was wrong. I didn't say he has a cure. We only said that he's working on a cure. <laughs> and up to now we are still waiting for the cure, but we haven't yet found it. So you see the fake news is actually everywhere. And um, I have like, my colleague from South Africa, your name is, is <laughs> bothering me, but I hope I'll learn how to pronounce it. My colleagues from South Africa is saying that he's raising a very critical issue about herbs because even here in Uganda, I know so many people rely on herbs to cure so many things. For example, there's this whole uh, element about COVID being a white people's disease. Uh, there's also the element of people uh, the white people rarely get flu because it's more or less affiliated to influenza flu. So people are saying, oh, for us here, we are always getting flu. So our immunity has already been boosted. So even if we get a common cold, it cannot put us down. Those guys in the, those guys, the whites, they're just getting uh, a cold because they are, they are not used to getting flu or, you know, or cough or something like that. So people have resorted to taking herbs 
in order to cure themselves of COVID because they believe if, you know, here in Uganda, if you have a cold, if you have a cough, you simply go to a, ma a mango tree, pick the mango leaves and chew them and you'll be fine within days, you know? So people are taking this in their, in their what? In their own hand. But uh, Jules and the entire team, I want us to digress a bit and look at um, being that you are liberal organizations and liberal entities, I want us to look at the critical issue that has arisen as a result of this COVID. And that is um, the, the human rights violations that we are witnessing in Uganda uh, that are coming up as a result of this, especially by the ruling government. Yes, much as we appreciate that the ruling government is doing all everything within, probably everything within their means to control the, the disease, but it's spread, but also to, help different people recover those that have been tested. Yeah, we are increasing our testing rates here in Uganda and all. We are getting more and more cases each and every day and yet people are still under lockdown and it has been lockdown for coming to uh, close to two and a half months right now. We are under lockdown. Although the president just recently released um, a few workers to, to, do, to be doing some work uh, as we wait with a guarantee of mass. I think for me, as we speak today even, as we are here right now, the ruling party that is the NRM in Uganda is today launching its NRM manifesto week. And yet there has been a serious clampdown on all opposition activities. And I think because already we are living in a dictatorship, the president uh, was already suppressing so many opposition activities, but now he has really utilized the COVID-19 to really clamp down on all opposition activities. For example, uh, I, I know that you are in a, in a country which is struggling with hunger because of poverty, the high levels of poverty. So much as people are under lockdown, people don't have what to eat. And yes, much as uh, the president and his committee, the entire task force are trying to fundraise and get money and get food to give people, People have given them food, even as the Popa movement, we contributed to the National Task Force and gave them food. But the big question remains, you cannot be able to reach everywhere. How many, how many Ugandans will you be able to reach with this food? So many Ugandans are, are people that work from, you know, you work and they are mouth, food, mouth people, hand to mouth people. So now we have Ugandans who have been locked up for over two months and they don't have food. When opposition leaders had started supply, supplying food to different people out there in the communities, in the countryside, the president immediately passed a directive that any leader, any leader that is caught uh, distributing food to citizens and does not, does not go through the national task force that he set up, which is comprised of his team, uh, the NRM people, is going to be charged with attempted murder. And after declaring that they are going to be charged with attempted murder, of course, so many people. I have to cut you short in, in, in just a moment because we are absolutely running out of time. So if you could find up, that would be great. Yeah, and yet we saw, as I conclude on this point, we saw so many uh, NRM leaning, NRM um, leaders, including ministers, including members of parliament, giving out food, donned in NRM t shirts, uh, crowded by large crowds, and none of them was even, uh, was even. Uh, arrested, and yet we had just one young man called uh, Zake, Honorable Zake, member of parliament, who did not even give out food, but sent people to give out the food, who was arrested and tortured as a result of giving out food. So this is uh, the, the huge clampdown on human rights and also opposition activities is something that is coming up very clearly right now in Uganda. And so I hope next time we can have a conversation around this, because much as there's, it's a deliberate effort to silence opposition parties and even the question of whether we shall have general elections next year has come into play because they want to postpone the elections as a result of the COVID. So I see that they are just taking advantage of every the COVID instead of uh, fighting the COVID, they are fighting even other activities, especially opposition, which is a bad thing. Thank you, Jules. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Flavia. It's uh, not an easy situation at all. Uh, we're seriously running out of time, so I'll quickly give the floor to uh, to William and then uh, and then pass on to uh, Anne Katrin, who, who can wind up the discussion. Uh, William, uh, one, one minute, please. Yes, um, I will just end by saying that uh, when in Africa, when you deny their people information, they create one, and the one they create will be very counterproductive. So what I suggest uh, the African government do is to prove that there is corona, because still there's denial. 
denial is at play. They have not seen the treatment centers. They have not seen people who are admitted. They have not seen people who are dead. So because of those things, they find it very difficult to believe that there is corona. In Africa, that's the problem. They need to see, and then they, when they see, they know it's, it's there, and then they will take precautions. But now, even the social distancing is not at work. And I've seen that in almost all African countries. On that note, I thank you very much. It's been a very good discussion. Thank you for that, uh, William, uh, all the way from, uh, from Sierra Leone. Uh, I see that uh, Clement is back. Uh, would, would you like to use one minute, uh, Clement? Indeed, uh, Jules, uh, just to wrap it up, I want to say that uh, across the African continent, there is there are mixed feelings about coronavirus. And uh, this is coupled because of uh, maybe lack of uh, proper equipment to diagnose it, and also proper, proper handling of the whole thing. Because uh, even when you hear of uh, people having coronavirus uh, or, or having uh, COVID-19, COVID they are all based in their own vicinities, their own houses. They're not quarantined in a, in a particular place. And people are questioning as to how serious we are on the continent, because we have not looked at the problem as a very serious problem. It's being taken as if it's a normal flu. Influenza has been here and uh, people do sneeze and they think it's one of the same thing. But uh, if you look at our experiences elsewhere, corona, the coronavirus is a serious issue, which we should be taking seriously, especially us as leaders and that we should um, ensure that we put measures in place so that at least it doesn't get off hand as it has happened in other countries. And uh, fortunately, the other countries, especially in Europe, they've got means of handling it. Whereas in Africa, if it was to hit us, the way it has hit other continents, we are going to have serious problems. I thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. And then uh, uh, I gladly, uh, for, the, for the, the closing, closing words, uh, go to uh, Anne Kathleen in, uh, in Berlin. Thank you. I have um, three short points. The first one is I think communication is essential, especially for democracies, because um, autocratic countries are very well in using social media and propaganda. And I think uh, uh, especially democratic democracies need to learn how to communicate on the right channels and to explain more um, how they are working and why they are doing what they do. The second point is um, regulation. I don't think that regulation of disinformation itself uh, will solve any problem because um, if you want to uh, control um, disinformation or information itself, you have to scan everything. So we need to focus on all the uh, topics around where we can regulate something so we can ensure freedom of speech. And the third one is platforms. Um, we see right now that platforms, um, Agnieszka touched this on this um, shortly, that they are willing and that they are able to do something against, against disinformation now on health topics, but they are also able to do something um, on uh, political disinformation. So they can do something, they have to do something, but we as societies need to have an oversight about what they are doing there. These are my points, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I think one of the, the main conclusion is that we need so much more time uh, to discuss these issues. Uh, uh, I'm really grateful to all of you uh, trying to, uh, to stick to, uh, to, to the time limits, which were way too precise. And I would have loved to, to spend several hours more. Uh, so maybe we should uh, make another appointment and, and meet online uh, to, to discuss this further. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, uh, I wish you all the best uh, in your work and uh, everybody at home as well and uh, stay healthy uh, and uh, let's continue to occupy us with, uh, with these themes uh, of uh, uh, government interference on the internet uh, and fake news because they are really serious and these are issues that uh, we have now but that are going to stay with us uh, throughout. So thank you very much.